Howdy y'all, welcome back, thank you for being here. Today, I had planned to make a simple video for you about the remarkable history of a vessel created in 1839 that just so happened to be the first electric vehicle in history, an electric boat, founded in St. Petersburg under direction of the famed Prussian and later Russian-affiliated imperial engineer Moritz Hermann von Jacobi, russified name Boris Jacobi. Jacobi was born in the Kingdom of Prussia in 1801. In 1834, at the prime age of 33, Jacobi was said to have begun the study of magnetic motors, which sparked the intuition that led to multiple grand advancements in electricity. More on that later, but first, let's dive into this concept of magnetic motors already being a topic of academic pursuit by the 1830s. The origin of the magnetic motor actually traces back much further than that. According to this narrative, the first electric motor in recorded history was created by the Scottish monk Andrew Gordon around the year 1744. Andrew Gordon was born to a high-ranking Scottish Catholic noble family in 1712. At the age of 12, he traveled to Bavaria to study at the Scottish monastery before traveling throughout Austria, France, and Italy with a focus on Rome. When Andrew Gordon returned, he gained degrees in philosophy, law, and theology, but his passion was said to be the study of electricity. By 1744, Andrew Gordon had published The Phenomena of the Electricity Explained, which coincided with his inventions of the electric whirl, a light metallic star supported on a sharp pivot with the pointed ends bent at right angles to the rays. The whirl was an electrostatic reaction motor. The second being the electric chimes, also called the German chimes, and they derive their theoretical importance as the first instance in history of the application of electric convection. In many of these narratives, Gordon is often not given the credit for these experiments, and the electric chimes were adopted by Benjamin Franklin for use in his 1752 lightning rod experiment. Remarkably, we're told most of these discoveries were kept relatively secretive, as if this was protected or esoteric knowledge, and it wasn't until 1771 that the principle behind these experiments was said to be fully understood, but again, the narrative leaves us with a lot to imagine. We're told Henry Cavendish isolated what became known later as Coulomb's Law in 1771, but he decided against publishing his findings, meaning the early 1740s experiments in electricity only yielded published results for academia to consume roughly 41 years later, in 1785, when the principle behind electricity was said to be discovered independently of Cavendish and his circle of elites. This was done by Charles Augustine de Coulomb, hence why it is now known as Coulomb's Law. Extrapolating on this further, in the 18th century, it's written that electric motors were impractical because generating enough power to run them was nearly impossible. That all changed in the year 1799 with the development of the electrochemical battery by Alessandro Volta, for whom the unit of measurement, the volt, takes its name, making it possible for a continuous feed of electric current. It took another 21 years for these old world alchemists to discover that an electric current creates a magnetic field. And in 1820, with this discovery by Hans Christian Orsted, we have a rapid advancement of magnetic motors. It was that same year, 1820, that André Marie Ampere developed the formula for electromagnetic interaction, proposing what is now known as Ampere's force law, detailing the production of mechanical force by the interaction of a magnetic field with an electric current. Then, just one year later, in 1821, the good man Michael Faraday was the first to officially demonstrate a rotary motor which was showcased in the dark basement of the Royal Institution. Essentially, a free hanging wire was dipped into liquid mercury and sat on top of the wire was a large magnet. When the electric current was passed through the wire, it quickly wrapped around the magnet, showing that the current gave rise to a close magnetic field around the wire. Faraday 
not only published his findings for all to read, but he actually created hundreds of pocket-sized machines that showcased this principle, which he sent to his colleagues across the world. This sparked the intrigue of Anjos Jedlik of Hungary, who then completed the first working electromagnetic coils, solving the technical issues of continuous rotation by inventing the commutator. By 1828, Jedlik had created the first practical DC motor, which included a stator, a rotor, and a commutator. The device employed no permanent magnets, as the magnetic fields of both the stationary and revolving components were produced solely by the currents flowing through their windings. Jedlik never sold his invention, and his device was never produced for profit, only for academic purposes, at least that is what we're told in the current narrative. The first DC electric motor that was used commercially and able to turn machinery was founded in 1832 by Englishman William Sturgeon. Following Sturgeon's work, word quickly spread to the New World, where Americans Thomas and Emily Davenport patented the first direct current electric motor in 1837. The motor was said to run multiple machines and even power a printing press, and yet, due to the high cost of producing primary battery power, the first patented direct current electric motor was a commercial failure and bankrupted the Davenports. What a coincidence. We're told several others simultaneously tried to develop direct current electric motors following Sturgeon in 1832, but all failed due to lack of battery power. That is, until the topic of today's video came into the narrative. It is written, even the Davenport's 1837 motor was considered to be relatively weak, and it wasn't until the Jewish, Prussian, Moritz von Jacobi perfected his rotating electric motor presented in 1834, the same year he began his studies, that electric motors truly became viable. We're told Jacobi's electric motor set a world record for electric power produced in 1834 and a design he would double in power by his prototype of 1838 in the engine that he would use to run the first electric boat of 1839. Remarkably, the same man we mentioned earlier, Jedlik of Hungary, who may have actually created the first direct current electric motor but never sold this concept, was said to have created for himself an electric carriage all the way back in 1828. If true, this would be a remarkable discovery and would possibly make his carriage the oldest recorded electric vehicle in history, created almost 200 years ago. We're told commercially available electric DC motors did not find success until roughly the 1870s after being showcased at the 1873 World's Fair in Vienna. Looking back to Moritz von Jacobi, he had moved to Russia by 1837 to work exclusively for the Russian Empire. There, he created the Maximum Power Theorem, also known as Jacobi's Law, which states the transfer of maximum power from a source with a fixed internal resistance to a load, the resistance of the load must be the same as that of the source. Furthermore, Jacobi founded the field of galvanoplastics, also known as electrotyping a method of printing using electroplating that is similar to a battery working in reverse. By 1842, Jacobi also began constructing underground telegraph wires connecting St. Petersburg to other parts of Russia, and he was a leading delegate to the Russian exhibitions at the World's Fairs. Jacobi had received the Demidov Prize for Science in 1840, and Jacobi also developed the naval mine in 1853 which involved the use of a galvanic cell and a long cable, which made the device able to be deployed from the shoreline. Jacobi's brother is the infamous mathematician Carl Gustav Jacob Jacobi, who contributed largely to the modern understanding of mathematics. Moritz von Jacobi lived out the remainder of his life in St. Petersburg, passing in 1874 at the age of 72. From what we've read for countless years about the ever mysterious developments that created the Russia of the old world, could we imagine 
that some of these things that were founded in the 18th and 19th century related to electricity could have played a major role in the destruction of the landscape once known as Tartaria or Grand Tartary. I'd love to hear your thoughts, ideas, and comments down below. If you'd like to reach out to me or support my channel, there's a link in my YouTube profile, and I can't wait to see you all on the next video.